Shop it, man! Shop it, squad. Today is the long-awaited return of everybody's favourite character on this channel. No, no, it's not the boy Barood, it's not the stoner friend, and it sure as hell isn't Samusa Joe. So get ready to pick some splinters out your foreheads. Keep your dimes in your pockets and put all referees on full lookout mode. Because today is the return of a wild slap nut. Jeff Jarrett. This video is basically going to be the second part to my Reign of Terror video, which I must say is probably the best video on this channel. We need to find out what happened to the founder of TNA after his Reign of Terror. Did he change his ways and start losing, or were the TNA locker room cruising for a bruising? I want to find out if Jarrett finally changed his ways and started putting over the younger talent, because he sure as hell didn't in the early days. Shout out to Lee, my best brother. He's getting married and it's his stag do up in Geordie land this weekend. So put your six pack on ice. The Stone Cold video will have to wait. There's no need to hate. Okay, let's get into this. Reign of Terror Part 2 or Reign of Failure is true. So where did we leave off last time? It was Bound for Glory 2006. Sting no sold the guitar shot and took Jeff's belt ending his Reign of Terror. Let me tell you, after watching back all that footage and seeing Jeff Jarrett finally tap out, it felt like a big deal and it was one of the happiest moments of my YouTube career. I guess not losing much does make it feel like a big deal when someone finally loses. Shame it couldn't have been someone other than Sting, the wrestler who least needed the win. Back on track, 2006. Okay, that was a long time ago. What the hell has Slap you been up to since then? Well, straight after the title loss, Jarrett was interviewed by JB whilst he cried in the locker room. JB asked him about his title rematch, but Jarrett said he's going home. Jarrett has an epiphany and says it's time to step aside. He started the company and carried it for four and a half years. He admits he dropped the ball on a few personal and professional things, but he says that Sting's capable of carrying the ball for TNA because Slapnuts is exhausted. This was not a Jarrett we were used to seeing, and talking of seeing, Jarrett wasn't seen on TNA programming for the next six months. He was focusing on his work as TNA Vice President. Get used to Jarrett taking a break from TNA, you're going to see a lot of it. Fast forward six months, it's now April 2007. A big feud is going on between Kurt Angle and Christian and all their little friends. They're due to have a lethal lockdown match, but there's a mystery man in that match. Jarrett comes out during a brawl looking like a blonde-haired Ronald McDonald. Everyone assumed he was here to side with Christian on the bad guy's side, but he wasn't. He blasted AJ Styles with his guitar and happily waved at Kurt Angle. Jarrett was his mystery man. Angle's teammates were really, really, really annoyed of Angle for trusting Slapnuts. In my eyes, Kurt could be forgiven trusting Jarrett because he hadn't had to deal with Jeff much. Joe was the most annoyed wrestler, calling him a scumbag, and he was just waiting for Jarrett to double-cross him in the main event. Angle was very defensive on bringing Jarrett back to TNA and called him one of the best wrestlers in the world, but he still admitted Jeff might screw him tonight. Fast forward to the end of the night and Jarrett was the perfect teammate in Lethal Lockdown. During the match, the idiot Abyss, who was basically a hybrid between Mick Foley and Kane, decided it was a good idea to load Jeff Jarrett's guitar with tacks. Moments later, much to everyone's surprise, <laughs> not, Jarrett smacked Abyss with the guitar and gave Sting the pin. This pin also meant that Sting would get a title shot, so once again Jarrett continues to only do what's right when it comes to the Stinger. After the match, Jarrett keeps trying to shake hands with Sting. Everyone's in shock that Slapnuts didn't screw the team. Jeff explains himself on the following impact saying it's no longer all about Jeff Jarrett and it's time to give back. Jarrett is now a face after everything bad he's done in TNA over the years. Randomly, Jeff Jarrett got involved in the feud between Eric Young and Robert Roode. Rude had been bullying Eric Young for months. It was revealed that Jeff Jarrett was Eric Young's secret friend, meaning somebody actually liked Eric Young. Jarrett saved him from a beating. Rude's manager almost slapped him in the nuts, but being one of Jarrett's four special moves, it had no effect. Guitar shot and Tracy Brooks is now dead. The following week, Robert Rude retaliated, smacking a handcuff Eric Young with a guitar. But I guess Jarrett can't have liked him that much because he didn't bother coming out to make the save. Shockingly, Robert Root beat Jeff Jarrett on pay-per-view, so I guess Jarrett wasn't lying and he is a new man who now lost to mid-carders. I'm in shock here. It wasn't clean, but I'll take it. Well, believe it or not, that's the entirety of Jeff Jarrett in TNA in 2007. Four appearances. Unfortunately, the positivity ends there. Jarrett lost his first wife Jill in May 2007 to cancer, and he'd take a long period away from TNA, and rightfully so. Some things are more important. Jarrett returned to TNA in September 2008, incredibly a year and four months away from TNA at this point. Now I'm going to breeze over the Kurt Angle stuff because what I really want to do is get to the downfall of Jarrett in 2011, that's the real entertaining stuff that you all want to see. But anyway, his first clash against Kurt Angle was really good, I've made a video on their few so it's worth checking out. He defeated Kurt Angle at Bound for Glory with help from his little friend. 
He didn't feature in any wrestling matches for another three months until he faced Kurt Angle again at Genesis 2009. This time he lost. He got legitimately injured in this match, so he had to take the next few months off of in-ring action. So I think you're all starting to see, Jeff was barely in TNA past 2006. Everything had changed for him. So he returned a few months later, and when he returned he was still booked high up the card, but he wasn't having title shots anymore. He mostly tried to help the pathetic TNA frontline compete with the main event Mafia. A feud with Eric Young was just starting up when out of the blue, Jeff was sent home. It had come to Dixie Carter's attention that Slapnuts was now with Kurt Angle's ex-wife Karen, and just like that, once again, Jeff was gone from TNA for another six months. During this time, it was reported that Jarrett had lost all of his control and power in TNA. Fast forward six months, we're at the end of 2009. Mick Foley's worrying about Hulk Hogan coming into TNA, and he makes a call to Jeff Jarrett on his laptop. He wants Jeff to come back to TNA and help him deal with Dixie Carter and Hulk Hogan. Jarrett responds saying, screw you and screw TNA. Well, he obviously had a rethink, because at the end of 2009, here he is, a homeless slap nuts. Jeff met with Mick and he wasn't happy. He kept screaming that he founded this company and they've made him sit at home for five months. Mick said most of the people don't want him in TNA after the stuff he did with Karen, but Mick thinks it's time for Jeff to come back now. Foley arranged for him to have a meeting with Dixie Carter where he could beg for his job back. It's interesting that they don't actually say about the stuff with Karen, but they just assume the viewers already know. Jeff asked her if he could come back to the company that he founded. Dixie gave him a bollocking about all the lies he told her. It looks like a little kid being told off by the headmistress. At this point, Dixie reveals a bit more about where he's been and says the plan was never for him to go to Pittsburgh and steal a man's wife. Ultimately, she tells him to go and have a very awkward conversation with Kurt Angle whilst Jeff stood in a filthy wife beater. Cue one of the most awkward moments in Impact history. Kurt won't even look at him in his face as Slapnuts does a crappy apology for his actions. Kurt doesn't accept his apology and Slapnuts is left in the lurch. Jeff also attended the debut episode of The Hawk on TNA as they went head to head with Monday Night Raw for the first time. Dixie doesn't look very happy to see Jeff back in the ring. Jeff gets an excellent ovation from the fans as he takes us for a walk down memory lane about how he started TNA. This was a nice promo from Jeff, he really seemed like he's changed at this point and he puts over all the young TNA talent. Unfortunately, he crossed the line in this promo because he says he's working hand in hand with Dixie and Hogan. The Hulkster appears on the Titantron and cuts a strange heel promo saying that nobody cares about what Jarrett's done in the past. Hogan accuses him of running the company into the ground and gives full credit to Dixie instead. Hogan reminds Jeff that he's Dixie's only partner and Jeff's minority shareholding in TNA doesn't mean a thing. Jeff Jarrett looks like he's about to cry as Hulk dumps Bird Turd all over his legacy. He tells Jarrett he's got no stroke and he needs to get in line with the young guys. This leads to Slapnuts throwing a tantrum in Hogan's office. Jarrett says to hell with the young guys, it's actually about him, Jeff Jarrett. He won't stop screaming that he founded TNA. Bischoff, the leader of the Grey Crew, also screams at him, he's sick of him. The Hawk almost loses it when Jeff calls him Bozo. Nothing is resolved, but Hogan and Bischoff plot to give Jeff an attitude adjustment down the line. Slapnuts is then called on the Bubba the Love Sponge show at 6 in the morning. Slappy says one of the truest things ever here, never thought I'd agree so much with him. He says TNA was doing just fine before Bubba the Love Sponge and Hulk Hogan. Bubba kept calling him throughout the show, and Jeff blamed Hogan and Bischoff for killing WCW. Bubba the Large Sponge sets up another meeting with Slapnuts and Hogan. At the meeting, Jeff begs for his job and swears he'd start at the bottom of the ladder. And this is where the bullying of Slapnuts is amped up. The story here is that Bischoff is trying to bully Jarrett out of TNA. They took away his music and pyro and he has to face Mr. Anderson without his added aesthetics. It's so confusing whether or not Jarrett's meant to be a heel or a face. I've said this a lot about his TNA run. Anderson slaps him in the nuts and rolls him up for the win. Then Anderson beats him up more after the match. Bischoff isn't impressed with the match and doesn't want to give Jeff any more big match opportunities. Later on, Bischoff demands that Jarrett sorts out the monster Abyss by smacking him with a barbed wire bat. Abyss whimpers and cries in the corner like a small baby as Jarrett faces him with the bat. In the end, Jeff decides not to hit him with it, which angers the leader of the Grey Crew. Bischoff has a bunch of wrestlers beat up Jarrett as a punishment. The next week, Jarrett said it's going to take a lot more than that to run him out of his own company. Bischoff apologises and promises to give him a better opportunity later that night. When they meet in the ring... <laughs> It turns out the opportunity is Jeff is going to be flipping burgers for TNA. Bischoff also puts a hair nut on Jeff. Slapnuts is dumping in his nappy of anger here, but he refuses to quit TNA. And Jeff actually does it. He flips burgers. Why do they eat so many burgers in TNA? Aren't they supposed to be athletes? Is Jeff crying or is it just those onions? Now Jarrett is very proud of his burger flipping skills and refuses to be broken. 
Bischoff tries to push him further by having him clean the men's room. Jeff vows to do a good job as janitor. Jeff settles into his new job and he's happily mopping away when he's jumped by Val Venus who Bischoff has asked to beat up Slapnuts. This is turned into a Fool's Count Anywhere match which never left the toilet. Venus wins it by pinning Jarrett on the filthy toilet floor. Jeff lies on the floor covered in piss and sweat crying. It's like a piece of Wes Briscoe's haircut. Jarrett still has no entrance music and he's still losing his matches. So the whole time TNA was going against WWE, Jarrett was made to look like a complete fool and a nobody. Slapnuts eventually has enough of Bischoff and bashes him with a guitar. At the same time, Mick Foley's in a similar position with Bischoff trying to drive him out of TNA. So Jarrett and Foley are put in a match together with the loser being fired from TNA. Jarrett wins this one, but it's not really a big deal because the match was a joke really. At this point, Jarrett hasn't been on a TNA pay-per-view for 9 months. This is not the narrative you're used to hearing on this channel, is it? Anyway, the bullying stuff was now over because Hogan told the locker room wife to lay off Slapnuts. Hogan puts Jeff Jarrett in a number 1 contenders match to say sorry, and he has to face AJ Styles, and this would be the best Slapnuts match we've had in ages. Unfortunately, Bischoff lied to Hogan and he's still screwing with Jarrett. AJ wins the match, but not cleanly. What follows is the most irritating storyline of all time. A storyline that lasted for four months and nobody had any idea what was going on. A bunch of former WCW talents were all speaking in tongues and riddles and bickering amongst each other. No one had any idea why any of them were fighting. Sting was being a dick and nobody understood why. For those of you who've been missing Slapnuts on pay-per-view, he finally made an appearance in Lockdown 2010. It was just a multi-man cage match though. It was during this match that Bischoff finally turned to the good side and helped Hogan out. The bullying ended here for Jarrett. He no longer wet his knickers in his sleep from fear of Bischoff. Anyway, back to the storyline. I still have no idea what's going on. Sting and Hogan have some sort of issue and they each have followers who think that they're right. Sting continues to refuse to explain his problems with Hogan. So Jarrett has now done a 360 and he's a Hogan follower. These problems lead to another pay-per-view match for Jarrett. And trust me, this one's a good one. It was Sacrifice 2010 and Jarrett was scheduled to face the Stinger Steve Borden. Except it didn't really go to plan for poor old Slapnuts because the Stinger jumped in before the match. He pops his shoulder out and gets him in the ring. Sting hits the Scorpion Death Drop and makes the cover and the match ends with a 12 second run time. Jeff is carried away on a stretcher and Sting cuts yet another cryptic promo. The fans chant hit the stretcher, so he does, he shoves Jarrett onto the floor. Hogan made his way out to protect his best friend Slapnuts. This takes him out of TNA for a month. Wow, is he ever actually in there anymore? Jeff returns a month later on pay-per-view. He smacks Sting with his bat and costs him his world title match. So this bizarre feud is somehow still going. I literally have no idea why they're fighting. So after getting his ass handed to him time and time again by the Stinger, he's finally had enough of being hit with the bat and decides to move on to feuding with someone else. It was Kevin Nash's turn and they feuded for the exact same reason as he and Sting did. A reason that isn't a reason because it was never given. Kevin Nash was now accusing Jeff of being the bad one and said he agreed with Sting although I don't know what they agreed over. So now we have a situation where Sting and Nash were feuding with Hogan and Jarrett. Samoa Joe was also added to the side of Hogan and Jarrett for some reason. Two weeks in a row, Jarrett lost singles matches to Kevin Nash and Sting, both in less than five minutes. It's nice that Jarrett is finally losing, but you know, couldn't he lose some matches to the young guys who really need a win? It's now late 2010 and I haven't seen a single guy get a win over him except Bobby Roode and AJ Styles, years apart. Even more randomly than Samoa Joe being involved, the Pope gets involved and joins the side of Nash and Sting. This was supposed to lead to a six man at Bound for Glory with Pope Nash and Sting versus Slapnuts Joe and Hogan. But of course the poor Hawk has a bad back so he has to be pulled from the matchup. None of this would have even been necessary if Nash and Sting could have just explained what the hell they're talking about all of these months. During the pay per view matchup, Jarrett finally shows his true colours as he ditches Samoa Joe halfway through the match whilst he grits his teeth and dumps in his nappy of anger. Joe has reverted back to his Samoan straining machine character. Later in the show, the whole storyline would finally be explained as Hogan, Bischoff and Hardy all turn heel and they're joined by Slapnuts amongst others. They were plotting to take over TNA this whole time and it's what Nash and Sting knew. If those two morons had just told someone this might not have happened, instead they were speaking in tongues the whole time. So for months, Slapnuts had been a face but he was secretly a heel the whole time. So he justified his heel turn by saying he hated Dixie for taking his company away from him. At least things are finally clear and we can move on. Jeff Jarrett is immortal. Being a heel seemed to turn Jeff Jarrett back into the old slap nuts. He takes out both Kurt Angle and Samoa Joe with attacks. 
In Jeff Jarrett's world, he had a hell of an end to 2010. Jarrett started off by beating the 7-footer Matt Morgan in a chain match. Samoa Joe by knockout. Jesse Neal by knockout. Samoa Joe again, this time by tap out. And no job, Rob. You know it's bad when even Rob does the job. Seems like he's really giving back to those TNA stars. So after that, Slapnuts went on to feud with Kurt Angle. These two certainly had some unfinished business. Again, I made a whole video on it, but basically Slapnuts had Kurt's ex-wife and his new wife Karen as his manager on TV. They had a bunch more matches and they were all pretty good. They traded wins until Angle won a match which banished Jeff to Mexico. Once again, Jeff was gone from TNA. The Immortal Faction continued without Jeff, but for some reason he was able to return to TNA a few months later. Jeff was now the AAA champion, but why he bothered coming back I have no idea. Jarrett was very proud of his new belt and he took on a Mexican gimmick where he wore a sombrero and a poncho everywhere he went. He was now calling the AAA title the Immortal World title. The gimmick got even more annoying when he helped terrible tag team Mexican America capture the tag belts. He barely wrestled in this run, he was just a background figure in Immortal. He was now a jobber, finally. He lost a handicap match against Bobby Roode. He wasn't the one who tapped though, it was Gunner. This led to his final TNA feud. Slapnuts was unhappy that Jeff Hardy had been given yet another chance in TNA following his drugged up episode at Victory Road 2011 against Sting. Jeff Hardy responded by saying Slapnuts was just jealous because no one will ever like him. Jarrett was more annoyed than others because he said it wasn't the first time Hardy had screwed TNA and he referenced Jeff Hardy no show in TNA Turning Point 2006. And let me tell you, this feud doesn't go well for Slapnuts. At Turning Point 2011, the two meet, and Slapnuts lost to a twist of fate in 8 seconds. Brilliant. Jarrett dumped in his nappy of anger and demanded that they have another match straight away. This time Jarrett loses it in 5 minutes. What a horrible pay-per-view for Slapnuts. This feud continues somehow, this time because Karen Jarrett reveals that Jeff Hardy is impotent, which she found out from Hardy's wife Beth. Slapnuts responds by doing a stupid promo pretending he's Jeff Hardy but it feels like he could have gone a lot further with this thing. It was a waste of time. He didn't talk about drug taking or being a hippie or anything. I guess they didn't want to anger Hardy. They always wanted him to re-sign with TNA. A missed opportunity. There's no reason for this feud to continue. Jeff Hardy beat Slapnuts for a third time on Impact. Because Slapnuts refused to leave Hardy alone, another match was made. This time it was going to be a cage match with Karen handcuffed to Sting. The loser of this match would be fired for impact. This was not as good as you would expect. It's a 10 minute match and Hardy is on top the whole time and he only gives Jarrett a chance because he misses a swan top from the top of the cage. It turns out the general manager Sting can fire either of the Jarretts. He was going to pick which. And this led to a bunch of wacky skits where both Karen and Jeff went behind each other's backs to suck up to Sting. Sting then showed them both back the video footage of them insulting each other to Sting. Steve Borden was enjoying seeing them screaming at each other and so was I. Sting then makes the brilliant decision to fire both of them. Now the reality here is that Jarrett was only being written off TV so we could go and do Rinker King, something I think we can all agree we're happy Jarrett did. But there's no hiding the fact that Jarrett's gone from TNA for, what is it, the fifth time? When Jarrett returns from India, he isn't given any work in TNA, so much like a bunch of the guys who were on the Rinker King show, TNA was done with them. In 2013, Jarrett and Toby Keith tried to buy TNA, which failed as they were too poor. No, I'm joking, but Bob Carter said he wouldn't sell to Jarrett unless Dixie Carter could remain as an on-screen character. Nobody wanted that, and Jeff said he'd rather not buy TNA. He went off to found GFW instead, which was supposed to revolutionise pro wrestling. Instead, it failed, but it did lead him to have two more TNA matches. And in typical Slapnut style, he won a King of the Mountain match beating Bobby Roode, Drew McDonald, Matt Hardy and Eric Young. So at least Jeff went out as a champion, except unfortunately for Jeff, this time it was a completely worthless belt, the King of the Mountain title. I'm going to have to wash my ass out with soap after saying that one. Oh yeah, and he never dropped the belt, he vacated it, way to put people over as usual slap nuts. He basically conned TNA into letting him and his new promotion have some TNA TV time to promote their shows in exchange for Jarrett's remaining shares in TNA. Jarrett then ended up suing the parent company of TNA for using GFW footage and branding. You can't make this up. But it gets funnier. The case is thrown out because it was believed that Jeff Jarrett had infiltrated the jury. What the hell does that even mean? Did he have his bitch wife sleep with a jury or something? Did he offer them fake gold? Did he promise them a part in his pyramid scheme? A settlement was agreed just last year. So that shows how long things can get dragged on for. So certainly not a happy end to Jarrett and TNA. 
Honestly, I'd love it if they could just kiss and make up because it'd be great to see Jeff back in TNA. That show doesn't bear any resemblance to the TNA I grew up watching. People want to see it and so do I. So as you can tell, Jeff Jarrett's second half in TNA was dreadful but for a different reason. He was no longer hogging the world title, instead he hogged airtime whilst he tried to stay relevant. He put more people over. But if you weren't from the WWE or WCW or called AJ Styles, you still couldn't beat Slapnuts. He lost two singles matches to guys outside of those two companies between 2006 and 2012. One to Rude and one to Styles, and both of those losses were only because of shenanigans. And that's it. So Jeff can say what he wants in his little podcast with John Bad Johnson, the fat guy that nobody wants. I don't think he had the TNA originals in mind ever. I don't think he wanted to help them, and I think he was always just about himself. The proof is in the pudding. He beat Samoa Joe in three singles matches. Let that set in. What I will say though in the defence of Slapnuts is no matter how annoying he was, his wife was worse. Trust me, you want to talk about Go Away Heat? When she was on the channel, I punched my TV screen out of the room. She was all over the show. She wasn't just there when Slapnuts was there. She was also involved with all the Knockouts Division stuff. Will someone please throw a brick at Karen? This run was not as bad as the first half because he was the champion for the first and he was shoved down our throats every week. Older Slapnuts kept taking breaks from TNA so it made it more bearable. But if he wasn't feuding with Kurt Angle, I couldn't help but think, why is he still in this company? He's dead weight at this point. He's another guy hogging onto TV time. And that's the end of this video, there's no need to rhyme.